Hi, everybody. My name is Marissa, and I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics with a minor in statistics. In today's lesson, we are going to discuss the difference between populations and samples. We will also compute a confidence interval and conduct a five-step hypothesis test. Let's imagine that we are working as a human resources manager in the state of California, and we are looking to hire an engineer to work at our company. In order to set a salary range for the position, we must understand what the average salary is for engineers in California. Although it would be ideal, we cannot find every single engineer in the state of California and ask them their salary. Instead, we must find a sample of engineers to compute this value. When we compute values, such as the mean, from data obtained from all members of a population, this is called a parameter. When we gather this information using only a sample of the population, it is called a statistic. When we use sample information to make assumptions about a population, this is called statistical inference. The two types of statistical inference we will discuss in this lesson are confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. One way to estimate a population parameter is using a confidence interval. Confidence intervals tell us how confident we are that the true population mean is contained within a given interval. In our engineer salary estimate example, Let's say that using a sample of 100 engineers, we calculate the mean to be 74,000 and our standard deviation to be 4,000. Because we computed our standard deviation from a sample, we are going to use the confidence interval formula for one population mean when the population standard deviation is unknown. The formula is x bar plus or minus t star times s over square root n. x bar is our sample mean, which will be 74,000. N is our sample size, which is 100, and S is our standard deviation of 4,000. The only value we are not given is T star. In order to find T star, we need to know both our alpha value and our degrees of freedom. Alpha is the probability of obtaining our results due to chance. Alpha is always assumed to be 0.05 unless specified otherwise. Our degrees of freedom are found by subtracting one from our sample size. In this case, our degrees of freedom would be 99 because 100 minus 1 is 99. We now have what we need to find our value of t star. Using Excel's t.inv.2t function, we input our alpha value first and then our degrees of freedom. This gives us a value of 1.984. Please keep in mind that other statistical software packages can be used to find the value of t star as well as a t table. We can now plug in all necessary values into our formula. When we multiply the value of t star by the value of s over the square root of n, this is called the margin of error. We now subtract the margin of error from the mean to get our lower interval and add the margin of error to the mean to get our upper interval. This gives us a confidence interval of 73,206 to 74,794. This means that we can be 95% confident that the true mean salary for engineers in California is between 73,206 and 74,794. Please note that there are several different parameters we can use confidence intervals for, but we only covered one in this lesson. Another type of statistical inference procedure is hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is used in order to determine whether or not a population parameter is significantly different from a hypothesized value. We begin a hypothesis test by setting up our null and alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is always in the form of h sub zero colon mu equals mu naught. Please note that mu naught is a general way to symbolize our hypothesized value of the mean and mu is a symbol for the population mean. The next hypothesis that is needed is our alternative hypothesis. An alternative hypothesis can be right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed. A hypothesis is right-tailed if we want to say that our observed value is more than our hypothesized value and is denoted by h sub a colon mu is greater than mu naught. A hypothesis is left-tailed if we want to say that our observed value is less than our hypothesized value and is denoted by h sub a colon mu is less than mu naught. A hypothesis is two-tailed if we want to say that our observed value is not equal to our hypothesized value, either bigger or smaller. A two-tailed alternative hypothesis 
is denoted by h sub a colon mu does not equal mu naught. Please note that hypothesis tests can be used to test several different parameters, not just mu. In the context of our example, let's say that we wanted to determine whether or not $73,000 is a fair wage to pay an engineer. This would mean that we would use a two-tailed test because we are not stating that this value is too high or too low. We just want to know if it is close to the value we see in the sample. It is now time to calculate our test statistic. Our test statistic for this hypothesis test is t because we do not know our population standard deviation. Using the formula t equals x bar minus mu divided by s over square root n, we obtain a test statistic of 2.5. It is now time to calculate our p-value. Please note that the critical value approach can also be used, but we will not cover it in this lesson. For a two-tailed p-value using the statistical software of your choice, such as shown here in Excel, we use the formula t.dis.2t and input our test statistic in degrees of freedom. This gives us a p-value of 0 0.0141. Now that we have our p-value and critical value, we can determine whether or not we reject our null hypothesis. If we reject our null hypothesis, this means that the value we obtained from our sample is significantly different than the hypothesized value. Because our two-tailed p-value of 0 0.0141 is less than our value of alpha of 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. The last step of our hypothesis test is stating our conclusion in the context of our scenario. In this case, we would say, reject the null hypothesis. There is enough evidence to support the claim that the average salary for engineers in California is not $73,000. Note that the claim is based on our alternative hypothesis. If we were to not reject the null hypothesis, we would have said, fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence to support the claim that the average salary for engineers in California is not $73,000. Great job, everyone. Today we learned about the difference between populations and samples. We also learned how to compute a confidence interval and conduct a five-step hypothesis test. Thanks for watching, and please check out other videos about statistics lessons and applications here on CHEG. Have a fantastic day, and I'll see you next time.